All right, so the next problem is a what we call a calorimetry problem. This is like what we did in lab. Um, we did a reaction calorimetry. These are, this example is about metals, but the key concept in understanding this is that the heat of an object is equal but opposite to the heat of whatever it's touching. So if that's a piece of metal in water, they will have the same amount of heat. It's just positive for one of them and negative for the other one depending if something is absorbing heat or giving it off. Um, so it says a temperature of 90.1. So I like to use subscripts here. So the, the mass of the metal is 95.3 grams. The temperature initially of the metal is 90.5. So it's pretty hot. And we put it into a calorimeter with 75.2 milliliters of water. Now, I'm suspicious that I need to look up density. Um, generally speaking, the I'm just going to assume density of water at a round room temperature, which is, I don't know, like 998.998 grams per milliliter. So if I knew, you could go look it up and probably get a more accurate number, a more precise number anyway. Um, but I'm just going to use what I remember. And again, we're, we're using we're using the density over here to go ahead and cancel milliliters. This time, uh, I don't have to flip the density over to do that because milliliters is on the bottom. Oops. So 75.0496, so 0 0.0, I'm just going to keep all of those because I don't want to round in the middle of the problem. And that is the mass of the metal. Nope, sorry. That's the mass of the water. Okay. Um, and the temperature of the water initially is 20.5. The final temperature of everything, so the final temperature of the metal and the water, because they're in contact, is going to be 28.6. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in delta T is, so for the water, we're going to end up at 28.6, and we start at 20.5. So that makes sense. The water got warmer when I put a hot metal into it. So of course the metal gets colder. So our temperature change is 8.1 degrees Celsius. So the heat capacity or the heat change for our water is gonna be the mass of our water times the heat capacity of just the water times the 8.1 degrees Celsius. So we'll get just joules from that. And I keep all the digits in my calculator, so I just scroll up to you to use it. And so we'll have two sig figs this time because of the temperature. So 2,543 will round to 2,500 joules. Now that's the heat of our water, and the reaction is asking for the specific heat of chromium metal. I'm going to use another piece of paper to continue this problem because I have used up all my space. Um, so I know that the Q for the metal is going to be an equal value, but an opposite sign. So it'll be negative 2,500 joules. I already noticed that I have the initial temperature for the metal uh, at 90.5. And the final is the same for both of them, so 28.6 degrees. You don't have to rewrite this if you had room on your page. Um, but I wanted it all in one place for you. Okay, so those are all the variables. Um, I'll do this a little differently than I've been doing it. So this is our equation. And I know I'm going to search for heat capacity, so I'm going to go ahead and just get things that aren't related to heat capacity out of my way. And so we end up with 
Q divided by mass time and temperature is how we can get to heat capacity. And that's what I've been doing all along. I'm just doing it in a I'm rearranging first and then plugging it in. Either way is fine with me. Oh, let's calculate our delta T. So it's final minus initial. So 28.6 degrees C minus 90, whoops, 90.5 degrees C. So of course the metal is going to get cooler. So negative 61.9 degrees Celsius is the temperature here. Our mass is 95.3 grams. And so the way we get a heat capacity that um, is positive, they would always be positive. They don't, being a negative heat capacity would mean it just generates energy constantly, which would be cool, but also not possible. Energy is conserved. So I have to have a negative sign in two places here in order to cancel that and get a positive thing. So if you've kept diligent uh, definitions on your variables here, you know what the final temperature is and the initial, and you'll make sure your temperature is the right sign. Also be careful about your sign of your reaction. So this is the reaction for the metal, not the water. So it's a negative. So anyway, be careful of that. That's the number one tripping point in thermodynamics is not having the sign. And then also the second issue is not having a unit. And so we always want to make sure those are correct and that they cancel properly. So after doing our calculation here, I find out 0 0.423795 is the heat capacity. I only have, let's see, I think we just have two sig figs because the heat change of, where is it, of our water right here is only two. And so that's only two. And that means over here, it's only two. So I'm gonna have to write 0.42. If I wanted to get a better value, I needed to measure that temperature more carefully or have a smaller volume of water so that it would increase the temperature by more than 10. All right, and so that's, that's that problem. All right, number two under the calorimetry section is gonna be about coal. Um, so let's define some variables here. I'm gonna do it on my other page. So I have some room to work. Um, so we have a mass of 1.245 grams. So this is number two on the calorimetry. Um, we have 2000 milliliters of water. Again, I can use that assumption about the density. I could look up the density if I was concerned about it, but for now, it's not actually one milliliter, one gram per milliliter, unless you're at four degrees Celsius. Anything higher or lower will have a lower density. That's the maximum density of water. Um, and I have more than three sig figs, so this is probably not a great assumption, but... It's just a worksheet. It's not actually lab data. So I'm all right just pretending it's okay. But our, our mass here will be 1,996 grams of water. So I'm going to use that. Oh, you can't see what I'm doing. There you go. Okay. Um, and then it says, oh, the water was at 17.15. So the initial water temperature is 17.5 degrees, actually. And the final will be 24.7 degrees Celsius. It wants us to figure out for A, how many joules of heat were produced by burning the coal. So we're going to, again, calculate the heat of the water and then convert the sign. So for our water, we have 1,996 grams. The heat capacity is the same as always because it's liquid water. And our temperature change is going to be from 24.7 to 17.5. Uh, well, the difference between those. And so plug everything in. My calculator says 60,129.1008. 
<laughs> I can't claim that many sig figs. Um, from this, this here is 7.2 degrees different, so I can only claim two. So my answer would be tricky. So Q of the water from the calculator is that value. But if I want to round to two sig figs, I've got to show that that is, zero is significant and the rest of the zeros are not. The only way I could do that is using scientific notation. Or convert it to kilojoules. That could work too. Um, so that's how many joules of heat were produced. So this is the answer for A. Okay. Now on to the next page, we have B. How much heat would one kilogram of this coal produce? So what we figured out on A was the number of joules in the combustion of just 1.24 grams. So I can't see my answer. So we have 60,000 joules, right? Where the, that zero is our last significant one. That was from combusting only 1.245 grams. So that many joules per gram. And then we want to find out how much energy a whole kilogram would be. That's only 2.2 pounds, so it's not that much, but um, if just a tiny amount of coal can produce that much energy, you, you imagine that you're gonna get a pretty big value, right? Gram and kilogram don't cancel, so I'm gonna add one more conversion factor so I can get that canceled. And then we would just have joules from this. Um, And so our answer is a very big number, as I said it would be. Um, I only have two sig figs, so I'm just going to round, but it's 48 million joules. That's a lot for just like 2.2 pounds of a substance. So that's the reason we should use coal for heating, right? Produces a whole lot of energy. Now we got to do a dimensional analysis problem. How many BTUs, which are called British thermal units, would this coal produce? And it gives us a conversion factor. So if I have 48 million joules and one joule is the same thing as 9.5 times 10 to the negative four BTU, I can, even though you may not even know what a BTU is, we can do this conversion anyways. Now, I'm not actually rounding in my calculator on this one, so I'm, well, I probably should. So to be consistent with yours, I'll put in 48 million times 9.5 e to the negative 4. And we end up figuring out that there's 4,560, nope, hold on, I can't, I can't write numbers, 45,600. BTUs that has too many sig figs, so I'm going to round it one more time. I can only get two because of that temperature. 46,000 BTUs is a fairly decent amount of energy. Now let's see how much we are affecting the environment by doing that. This is a gas laws problem. Um, so the question is, what volume of carbon dioxide are we adding uh, to the atmosphere <laughs> at room temperature? Um, so we know that there is a kilogram of coal. Coal, if you didn't know, is just carbon for the most part. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and convert that to grams. And then I can use the molar mass of a carbon. Okay, and that'll tell me how many moles of carbon are being produced. Uh, well, it tells me at least how many moles of carbon are being consumed, rather. Um, so I'm going to take 1,000 divided by 12.01. So, oops, I keep bumping the cord. This is difficult to organize logistically. All right, there. So 83.26 moles of carbon are used. Now I need a balanced reaction um, to combust carbon. 
So far this semester, we've only talked about combustion of hydrocarbons. If you don't have any hydrogen though, this is pretty straightforward. I'm just gonna take oxygen from the air, carbon from the coal and you get CO2. So it's a one-to-one -one situation. That means I can, I can use a molar ratio, which won't change the number, but it changes the unit here. So 83.26 moles of CO2 are generated by burning one kilogram of coal, okay? Now, to figure the volume of this, I need to use the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. I'll just rearrange. So we'll do NRT over P. The number of moles is 83.26. R is um, our constant. liters times atmospheres per mole K. And then um, the temperature is room temperature. That's around 20, but I need to consider that it needs to be in Kelvin because this is a gas laws problem. So 20 is room temperature. I'm gonna add my 273.15. So basically 293.15 here, Kelvin. And our pressure, well, it's probably standard pressure, which is one atmosphere, okay? So we'll take okay. Okay, so when I put all of that in the calculator, we find the volume is quite large, 2,002.9 liters. So liters is the only thing that doesn't cancel here. And so I know that I've done my problem correctly. Let's check our sig figs. Well, actually it's just one kilogram. So that's not clear if that's a measurement. So maybe that doesn't have significant figures. So you could just write whatever you want really, but it should be around 2000 liters, which is a lot. All right, so next up, we have, let me get this adjusted again. Keeps, keeps sinking. Okay, um, we're doing a heat of neutralization. This is real similar to something we did in lab. Um, and so this is our initial data. And we also have temperatures here. It's asking us to find the enthalpy in kilojoules per mole. Okay. So, let's see here. All right, so our this is exactly what we did in lab. I'm gonna break it down in the same way. Um, first off, we need to find the mass of our system. So in this case, it's 100 milliliters of HCl and 100 milliliters of water, so 200 total. Um, for this one in lab, we were told the density is one gram per milliliter. Some of the other solutions were 1.02, so it depends. That means that I have 200.0 grams of water, more or less, that we have in our reaction. And then I'm going to add 4.1354 grams. That gives us our total mass. Okay, so then to find Q of our water, I need to know the temperature change of the water. It's going to go 22.5 minus 19.2. And then I'll plug everything into the heat capacity equation for water. So we have a 3.3 .3 degree, again, two sig figs because of that temperature change being so, so small and only going to a 10th of a degree. Okay. Gosh, this is really, the cord keeps falling. Sorry about that. Um, okay, anyways. I got my cords under control now. Um, so we're going to figure out the heat capacity or the heat change of the water by using the heat capacity of water and this mass that we figured out. So 
1.3354 times the heat capacity of water, because that's what we measured, times our temperature change. And so for the, the water, um, Okay, and so the calculator says 2,818.5 and a bunch of other things. That's joules because that's the only thing that doesn't cancel. I noted two sig figs, so I'll round to 2,800 joules. The question's asking for kilojoules per mole, so I'll go ahead and convert. Now to get it per mole, I have to think about how much water was made. That's going to be based on the mass of our NaOH. So when we had solids in the lab, we used NaOH. The um, number of moles here is actually pretty easy to figure out for the HCl because it's an aqueous solution and it's one molar, which is, again, mole per liter. So I can do the dimensional analysis to figure out that it's exactly 0.1 mole of HCl. For the NaOH, I'm gonna go ahead and calculate the molar mass. I hope by now that you know how to do that, but it's 22.99 plus 15.999 plus 1.008. So we got 39.997 grams for one mole. And so total uh, total number of moles there is going to be 0 0.103. Um, I got five sig figs, so 10339. So I have excess NaOH compared to the amount of HCl. So I'm actually gonna choose to use the moles of, of HCl on this one because there are fewer moles of HCl. And I remember that this is a one-to-one -one reaction. So we'll divide by 0 0.100 moles. I'll show you the rest of this. I did skip it, which was lazy. Um, here's my logic though. Um, if I have a balanced reaction, this is your pre-lab from our uh, thermo experiment last week. It's one to one for NaOH, HCl. It's gonna produce one NaCl and one water. So my molar ratio here would be one mole of HCl for every one mole of water that's formed. So if I have 0.1 moles of HCl, I'll have 0.1 moles of water. And so 2.8 divided by 0.1 gives us 28 kilojoules per mole. Again, really, really similar process to what we did in labs. So hopefully that's uh, familiar to you. But if not, there you go. Now you can do some lab calculations if you haven't. Um, all right. So the next ones are all multiple choice. I'm going to cover those in the next video.